Hello and welcome back to episode 2, part 2 of Cryptoids. I spoke with Shatan Noor about Bigfoot and Dogman last week, particularly more about Sasquatch, and now this week's part 2 episode we begin to speak about Dogman and some of the findings that Shatan had while she was just going out on the beach not looking for any evidence. Listen in and see what's going on here. I took pictures of my foot right next to the footprints so that I could, because I was going to a big conference and I was going to be like, hey guys, come here. Yeah, exactly. Everybody, what is this? Stop to go party and look at that. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. And then everybody's like, well, where was this? Uh-huh. And, you know, I told them the exact location. They're all like, that's all the way over in Michigan. I'm like, well, I didn't say it was close. Right. My guys. Um, so, you know, getting that picture or series of pictures um, with, you know, and I was wearing um, what I call my strappy sandals, that, which have a thinner strap on them, so you can clearly see my foot with my teal chipped nail polish, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, right next to this very deep track that's, in, you know, into mm-hmm. the sand. And the crazy thing about this is that foot track is less than 150 feet from that rust area. So this creature had no fear of humans because mm. it knows humans come in and out of that rust area all day. Yeah, it had no fear of being seen, did it? No. Or interacting with humans, it just didn't care. It was going for a drink, it was going to go fishing, it was going to do whatever it wanted to do, and oh well. That there's humans in the vicinity. Right, like what's somebody going to do about it? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that large, you know. Um, and you, you know, you mentioned earlier that usually um, sightings are happenstance. Right. So, is that more than likely why? Probably like when we see, see the TV shows of people out hunting Bigfoot, they might find some trace evidence, but you usually don't get any shots, right? Because well, so people, you know. There, there's a very weird expectation with um, the TV shows that do cryptozoology. Um, paranormal locations, you can usually get evidence in one night there. But when you're dealing with living, breathing creatures that roam in and out of an area, they're not contained at all. It can be, like you said, a happenstance of when you might get a sighting or evidence scientists, biologists who go out to document animals that they think live in a location, Mm -hmm. they set up camera traps everywhere, and they can go six months without anything showing up on that camera, and then one day, oh, they get a surprise picture of the very animal that they're looking for. And a lot of times with these shows, the researchers are maybe in location for a week, maybe two weeks, and what normally happens, and any hunter will tell you this, when humans go into an area and they are either making noise or they're trying to be very discreet, scattered. the natural world realizes that, hey, there's somebody here, and will disperse. And it isn't until they become accustomed to the human being being you know, being there, mm-hmm. that they will come back around. Birds are always around humans because they see us every day. And usually their interactions with us are we feed them. Right. We throw them, you know, ducks, geese, the same thing. But if you're in a lake where there's not human populations that are throwing out food, the ducks are going to be very wary of you. The same concept applies to the Bigfoots and the Dogmen. They know that you're there, but they're going to watch you to see what you're doing. And some people, some researchers will say, well, we're going to act like we're camping. Because, you know, there's nothing threatening about camping. Sure. If anything, we're going to be entertainment for them. And they secretly put up cameras here and there and try to get, you know, um, footage. Sometimes they get some, sometimes they don't. Um, but it's always interesting when they don't have the camera traps that they will get encounters where they're in their tents, but 
something is brushing up against the tent. Mm -hmm. Something might pee on the side of the tent, mm -hmm. marking it as territory. Yeah. Um, I know of uh, one Bigfoot researcher who, um, this was about five years ago when the peanut butter traps were really popular, they would open up a can of peanut butter and hang it um, with uh, twine or something from a tree in hopes that the Bigfoots would reach in and you know, pull out the peanut butter to eat it and would leave hair. And I know of at least one researcher who that angered the Bigfoot and when they got back to their tent, their tent was covered with peanut butter on the outside. <laughs> It's, it's kind of funny. It's almost like he's got a sense of humor. Yeah. I mean, or, yeah. Or it's like, uh, yeah, I know how dare you, you do this? Yeah, you know, I know what you did. I'm going to wipe my hands off. Here's the proof of it, yeah. Are they going to come into your campsite and steal food? They like can't. The bear will? They can't. Because to them, it's, well, if, if you're going to leave the food out, we're going to eat it. Right. And, you know. You know, I... I I, I'm not an expert on cryptids. I'm more of an expert on ghosts and demonic mm -hmm. stuff, you know. But uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading lately because I want to get into uh, understanding this more. And it seems to me like 90% of the times, the stories I hear about a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, they're actually quite passive and they really don't seem to want to hurt people. They just kind of want to be left alone unless they present themselves to you where what I've read about the dog man, every single encounter from people's perspective of what they've witnessed supposedly is that these things are very aggressive, very mm -hmm. assertive. And um, it makes me wonder, you know, I mean, it's almost like a wild dog versus a monkey. Well, and that's where, that's where we have some misinformation because if you research wild canines like wolves and foxes versus primates like chimpanzees and apes, a lot of times what we see depicted of the ape behavior, they try to show them as a very passive animal, but research how chimpanzees go to war. It's not a pleasant thing because it's very when zoos have a colony of existing chimpanzees or apes or bonobos or gorillas or um, anything of that matter it's very hard to introduce a new member mm -hmm. to the group because they will attack it and kill it is that because they've even if they're not with the same dna don't they kind of like cluster as a family after yes. a while right there are family groups now the only time there's a a exception is when they get tired of the existing dominant male, the females will just get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Or a bigger, younger male will. male will come in and dispatch that other male, and then he's breeding with them. Yeah. Um, but then the moms kind of have to worry about their new offspring because it's a very known fact that new males in a group will try to kill the other male's I offspring. I heard that. And the females aren't going to put up with that. So. Warfare in the animal kingdom is just as violent, whether it's primates or canines, even felines, um, that are similar in human behavior, but because we want to believe that they, the primates are civil and more peaceful, we, we don't tend to, you know, pay attention to that, but um, the, the apes and the primates are and the chimpanzees are just as likely to attack as the canines. So I, I would agree people, that. you know, people think that the Bigfoots are more passive, and that's what you know people have have been led to believe. But there's just as many reports out there of the Bigfoots being aggressive and not wanting the human activity, not wanting humans in their ter territory and doing what they can to chase them out, whether it's throwing rocks at them, um, stalking them, um, chasing them. Um, it's very unlikely that a human being would survive a Bigfoot attack. I wouldn't see attack how, you, how you could. Quite because honestly. one single chimp, chimpanzee 
is strong enough to rip a human being apart. Right. And now double that. Or more. Quadruple that <laughs> yeah. to the size of a Bigfoot. Nine and foot tall hairy beast coming. You have you know, claws too. I mean, we don't have big claws. Back yeah, them, you know, you have you have a, a animal that could easily pick up hundred pound boulders and just hurl them at you. Oh, and if you get hit with hundred pound bo well, you know, you're, boulder, you're, you're not doing any much. Uh, you know, you're just <laughs> you're you're going to become part of the landscape. And <laughs> um, <laughs> now, in the dog man, of course, we see it as more predatory because it's a canine. We know that wolves hunt. That's how they make their living. We know that coyotes hunt. Coyotes are the banes of farmers and ranchers everywhere, um, but they are just as important to the ecosystem because they will take out the sick and injured animals that will spread diseases to other populations. Sure. So, but we see the canines, you know, even though we have our, we all love our domestic dogs, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, um, in any breed in between, but when we see the wolves, we recognize that as a predator that is a threat to human beings. Sure. Now you scale that creature, that four-legged wolf, which are quite big, up to a seven to nine foot tall bipedal creature that hunts in a pack, and suddenly you have a very bad scenario for a human being encountering them. And yet people are out looking for them and, and yeah. you know and I, I, I stuff I read you know you don't know what's true and what's not but um, I'm getting the indication that a lot of people go out to actually hunt them to, you know to harm these things and, you know, and, and that, which I don't agree with by the way just like no you know. and you know and they say they, they do it for science the problem with hunting and killing a dog man or a bigfoot is one the only thing you're going to learn is the forensics from a corpse. You're not going to learn anything about intelligence, no behavior, activity. behavior, personality, none of that. Learning the skills, none of that. It's much better to take a living, breathing creature than it is a dead one because a living, breathing one, the zoos, Biologists, scientists from all over the world can study that. A dead corpse gets taken apart piece by piece, and you can't, after a while, you can't trace, well, did this come from that actual creature, or is this a fake piece or a hoax? Hmm. Because somebody's trying to disinformation. Right. Somebody doesn't want this knowledge out there. So I always say if they can capture a live one, then it has to be done with respect to the animal and done so that every biologist, every scientist, every zoo can observe the animal and universal studies be done of it. Whereas if there is a blood test done, everybody has access to that blood test. It's not just one group that, you know, is hoarding the information. Right. If you have that, you know, information, if you have that creature, if you have that evidence, then everybody should have access to it. How, how disadvantaged would the world be if the first complete Tyrannosaurus that was ever found, if the person who found it hoarded it and put it away in a storage facility? <laughs> sure. Nobody would ever know right. truly what a T-Rex looked like, how big they were, what they ate. We might have a guess because we might find a bone here or there, but nobody would really know the, the true extent of it. Extent of it. And mm -hmm. that's how it has to be with if anybody actually ca ever captures one of these animals. And so, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, to go out and look for one of these bipedal creatures, these cryptoids, cryptoids um, it's not really foolish as long as you plan on going out and respecting nature, right, and respecting not only, you know, the Sasquatch or the possible dogman you might encounter, but everything out there. Don't litter, you know, right. uh, leave less than what you bring, right, right. Um, that type of thing, right, like like camping etiquette, so to speak, mm -hmm. right, and then um, also my understanding is that if you are 
non-threatening, like say you're not being super loud or shooting off guns and stuff arbitrarily and things like that. Um, any wildlife, they, they will eventually get cust accustomed mm -hmm. to you being out there. My wife and I, we went out in the woods back in June of last year, and um, you know, we were out there maybe 20 minutes, and at first everything was super quiet, and then by the time we just decided to be quiet and respectful, and we were going off, I mean, we were out probably a couple miles out right. in this woods, and everything started acting like we weren't even there eventually, you know. But something weird did occur, um, paranormal activity, way out in the woods. She was hearing um, footsteps, like running, like humans running through the path or by us, but obviously, and we're filming and there's nothing there. And we're like, okay, <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. And and I did think I saw a streak, but I didn't get it on camera. But we did capture um, what a few other, I guess you'd call them experts um, in cryptozoology. We, we think we might have captured a Sasquatch. Okay. Probably about 60 yards from me. Because we were tree tapping, you know, trying to get them to draw their attention. And um, I panned out about 60 yards out and I zoomed in and it, it looked like a head and it looked like a big back and all oh, this hairy thing. And it had sunlight actually reflecting off portions of the hair all the way down the silhouette of it in the back. And then by the time I panned back, it was gone. So then I walked up to where I thought that area was because the sun was just coming in that mm -hmm. one spot and nothing even looked similar anymore. Right. My whole surroundings looked completely different, you know. And But whatever that large object was, it was no longer there, which, it would, I mean, you could see it in the camera, you know, mm -hmm. and it was no longer there. So I think I might have come oh, across one, you know. You could have possibly done that. So if the dog man is part canine and part human, where did it come from? And you that's, know? that's you know, the question that we keep asking because the Sasquatch, by all directions, every avenue that you look at, should be here on Earth because we have the fossil records of the primate family tree. And we are still finding new members of that tree. And so we know that the Bigfoots are here, we know that the Sasquatch are here. and they fit into this higher area of the family tree that has human beings, um, the chimpanzees, um, most of your prehistoric human beings, the Neanderthals, Cro-Magdon man, um, who have established themselves in different parts of the world mm -hmm. and then melded together. What we don't have is a fossil that says a upright walking canine should be living here on Earth. We have, so in terms of big canines, everybody looks at the dire wolf. Well, now paleontologists, now biologists are re-examining the dire wolf because we don't know if it was actually a real wolf or if it was this weird area that maybe it was more hyena, maybe it was more big cat. Even things like Smilodon, they don't think we're feline. They are putting them now in this bubble area in between canine, feline, and hyenodon. So mm -hmm. you've got you know, this bubble area where we're pulling information from, but we don't know if it's, you know, we're gonna throw it at the board and just see if it sticks. But Canine-wise, so we know that gray wolves and timber wolves are quite large, but are they bigger than a Great Dane? Are they bigger than an Irish wolfhound? Those are your two tallest dog canines in the world. Are they bigger mass-wise than an English Mastiff, a Tibetan Mastiff, um, the Caucasian uh, Anatolian Shepherd? I know there's a bigger one out there, but um, I've seen pictures of it, but I'm not quite sure. Um, those are very large, 200 pound dog breeds. Even your Newfoundlands and St. Bernards are giant dog breeds. Oh yeah, huge. So we have those big dog breeds, but none of those can walk bipedal. They are not structured. We have seen people train dogs to walk on their hind legs. Things like Belgian Malinois and Doodles. Um, 
uh, poodles and yeah, uh, Bashans, and stuff, um, yeah. but their their hip structure is different. Their body frames are different. They can support themselves, but they can't do it for a long period of right. time. Just like we've seen bears can walk around their highlights, but they don't do it for a long time. With the dog man, we're talking about a canine creature that is bipedal, and there's a difference between dog man and the superstition, supernatural werewolf, which is a human that turns into right. a canine type creature. They're totally separate. 